as we pray a prayer that was written a long, long time ago that invites this great God who's got this amazing, blessed name that we've just heard about from the orchestra. So we invite him into this presence, into this place, his place, to join us as we worship him. Let's sing together. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy praise of mercy never ceasing call for songs of love and praise and teach me some melodious song sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon it now the
hands till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now being with us, that we're never alone. Let's continue to worship him as we sing.
being the kind of great and awesome God who would give your life that we might know life, who would come to be one of us and show us the way to the Father and then provide that way through your death on a cruel criminal's cross. Hallelujah, Jesus, we say to you this morning for all you've done, not just to save us, but to redeem us, to transform us, and provide for us both life eternal, life forever, and abundant life here on this earth. Use us, oh God, as instruments of your grace. We applaud you, our great God. You're amazing. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. We were in Guatemala for seven days, and the first two days that we were there, we went to the City of Children, which is an orphanage in Guatemala City. It's government run. So this orphanage houses all of Guatemala's social orphans, um, kids whose parents didn't want them, they send them there. Kids who they just found on the street, they would send them there. We did a variety of activities. We did an art and craft, we did a little Bible study, and um, I think every session for morning and afternoon, we'd have around 150 kids. The remaining days that we were there, um, Guatemala has set up these community transformation centers. There's three of them that are surrounding the city in Guatemala. And what these are, these kids that live in these communities, they're not necessarily orphans yet. And so Buckner has established these transformation centers there, hoping to prevent um, the kids and the families from having to enter the orphanage system. And so every day we went to a different CTC. We would do worship songs, we'd give them a Bible study, and we also had the ability to give them juice and crackers as a snack. Whenever we'd worship with them and sing songs, you could tell that they weren't just like sitting there just ignoring what we were saying. I mean, they would get up right up with us and they would sing the songs and, you know, during worship and Bible study, they were very attentive. And um, even though we didn't see them specifically get saved. I'm sure that there's a lot of seeds planted in their hearts because after we would leave, they would almost be crying, begging us to stay just because they loved us there. And um, I think we made a big impact in their lives. One thing that was very apparent while we were in Guatemala was that, you know, God's love doesn't have a language. You know, a hug and a kiss is just as good as sitting there and having a Bible study with them. You know, um, God's word will never return void. And even though we had a little bit of difficulty speaking the language and stuff, you could tell that the kids really understood while we were there. Everybody leaving. It's like it's my turn. <laughs> I wasn't sure. Well, let's uh, take our Bibles, if you have them with you this morning, open them to uh, John's Gospel, John chapter uh, 4. We're going to look at the question of engagement this morning, the question of, of engagement. And uh, great irony this weekend, while we can't drink water, we have a, a scripture verse that deals with living water uh, this morning. So, uh, uh, let's entertain this passage of Scripture and think about the question of engagement. I can think of no other passage of Scripture that gives us a better insight as to what we're to be about as a church than, than Jesus' dealing with the woman at the well of Sychar. Uh, because one of the things that we glean from this is Jesus' strategy and his approach to evangelism. Now, we use the language a great deal in the life of our, of our church of, of being a missional people. Uh, we use that language very intentionally about being missional, being, being missional believers, being a missional church. Now, you won't hear us talk about missions except in the context of us being missional because it's only as you and I are missional that missions is accomplished. 
Now, the reason we do that so strategically and so intentionally is that in years past, in, in the years of this kind of institutional mindset that people used to have in their approach to the life of faith, whenever you talked about missions, people had the idea that missions was something that was done off somewhere else by somebody else other than us. And it really created a dysfunctional view for the church, the local church. The missions became something that we supported so that others might do it someplace other than where we are right now. But when we rightly understand the biblical admonition of what it means to be the church, of what it means to be the presence of Christ in the world on a daily basis, we intentionally and strategically use this language of being missional so that you and I will never excuse our missional endeavors as being the responsibility of someone else. You see, the idea of being a missional Christian and being a missional church means that each one of us recognize the call of God upon our life, and we recognize that it's our responsibility wherever we are during the day, during the course of a day, everyday life, whether I'm at work, whether I'm at, at school, wherever I might be out in the community, I recognize as a missional believer, I recognize that I am the presence of Christ. I am his witness, I am his testimony, wherever I might find myself. And nowhere do I find a better portrait of what it means to be missional than in the life of Jesus himself. You see, one of the things I so appreciate about, about Jesus is that he never imposes anything upon us, he never expects anything of us that he didn't practice himself. And now we find Jesus here engaging in this conversation with, with the Samaritan woman. And he has, he has just left Jerusalem. If we went back to John chapter 3 where we were last week, he was in, he, he was in Jerusalem, the region of, of Judea. And now he's moving towards Samaria. And whenever I realized this geographical shift, this change, this outreach effort of, of Jesus, I couldn't help but think of the admonition that he gave to his disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 where he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And now he's practicing that, he's modeling that in his own life. While it would have been very easy for him to stay in this strategic location uh, in the city of, of Jerusalem, in the region of, of Judea, he realizes that, that the spreading of Christianity, the spreading of good news is for all people in all places. And so it necessitates him to go to places like Samaria that are off the beaten path, that, that are remote. It reminds us, and listen church, not only is God no respecter of persons, God is no respecter of places. And so wherever we are at any given time, we're to be a missional people who sees the opportunities that, that, that cross our path each and every day, circumstances that, that, may, that, that may seem circumstantial, that may seem haphazard, we need to embrace a, a view that, that these are divine opportunities to be the presence of Christ and speak of the things of God. And so how do we engage? What does engagement look like? If we're to be a people who engage, how should that look? How should it be practiced? I almost divided this, this text, this chapter up into two, into, into two sermons. Because there's a lot of ground. Th these verses are pregnant with meaning when it comes to understanding what it means to be a missional people and how we are to engage in our faith. But let's just begin going through these. There's several things that, that, are, that need to be, to be highlighted when we deal with this question of, of engagement. The first one, if we just pick it up in verse 4, the first thing we need to know that this idea of, of engagement is a compelling necessity. This engagement that we're to be about, it is something that is very compelling in the life of a believer and a follower of Christ. Now, notice in verse 4, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now, don't misunderstand that this English is a little bit uh, too smooth, and it misses what he's really saying in the Greek. What it says in the Greek, in the tense that is used, is, is an imperfect verb. 
He had to go. It's an imperfect verb. It's imperfect, continuing, ongoing action. It would be better translated, he absolutely had to go to Samaria. Now think about that in contrast to the way it reads, in, at least in the New American Standard, and he had to pass through Samaria. It made it sound like he has another, another destination, but, but he had to go through another city to get there. It'd be like me saying, well, I, uh, I, I'm going to Tyler, but, but I had to go to Dallas. No, what, what, what this verse is saying is that there is this compelling that Jesus had that he had to go to Samaria. Well, we understand that as, as people of faith. You know, when you have, a, when you have an encounter with, with the living God, when, when he has changed your life, when he has given to you a sense of mission, there is this compelling. There, there is the presence of the Holy Spirit working and stirring in our heart, our mind, and our eyes. And we, and we feel compelled to tell our story. Becoming a Christian at the age of 21 as a junior in college, you know, I, I just felt compelled to talk about what I was and what I was becoming. To talk about what my life had been and how Christ had transformed me. It's just part of, of the faith experience. You can go back to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, there's this, there's this marvelous portrait, painting, and words of, of the vision of Isaiah. When, when he sees God in heaven, the cherubim, the, the angels, the, the angelic beings. And near the end of that, that vision, God says, who shall I send? Who will go for us? Isaiah's response is, here am I. Send me. Because this, this encounter with God was so transformational, it was a compelling necessity in his life. But, but something else I want us to notice. Engagement not only is a compelling necessity, but engagement confronts our prejudice. When we go out and be a people, and be a people that, that engage others in matters of faith, engagement is something that, that confronts our prejudice. Now, now notice here, it says in verse 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now you have to understand the background of this a little bit. Most Jews in that day and time would walk around Samarias. Samaritans were considered to be half-breeds. This prejudice that the Jewish nation had towards Samaria goes back to 720 B.C. It had to do when, when uh, the Jews of, of central Palestine, northern Palestine, they, they, they married, they interbreeded with, with the invading Assyrians. And the Jews in the southern Palestinian region were, were so upset with this, so bothered by this, that, that, that it caused this age-old rift between north and south. And they considered the Samaritans, these Jews who had married Assyrians, they considered them to be half-breeds. And they viewed them with contempt. And so serious was this prejudice that Jews in the day of Jesus, when they had to travel north, they would go around Samaria so that they could remain ceremonially pure. But not Jesus. Notice the woman is, is even shocked. You jump down to verse 7. There, was, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink? Since I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. I mean, Jesus is really going against the cultural norms because not only is, a, is he a Jew speaking to a, to a Samaritan, he's also a male speaking to a woman. And women and, and children and, and widows, they, in that day and time, they had no position. They, they had no voice. They were a people that, that were marginalized in that day and time. But Jesus set aside those kind of prejudices. He confronted those prejudices to show how important it is that we engage others unlike us in conversations about the things of God. See, when you recognize the 
call of Christ, when you've had that transforming experience with Christ, it helps to overcome all of those. You realize that your calling is so significant that you set aside all of your biases, your prejudices. What are they? What are yours? It's racial. If it's not racial, maybe it's, maybe it's socioeconomic prejudice. Maybe your thought is, well, they, they just wouldn't fit in. They're not, they're not our kind of, of people. Racial prejudice, economic prejudice, maybe even, maybe even religious prejudice that you have. Oh, they, they don't believe, they, they wouldn't have any interest in things. I'm, I'm just not going to talk to them about that. What is it, what is it that, that, that is your bias? What is your wall in your life? What is your prejudice that keeps you from engaging people outside the confines of this wonderful sanctuary? What is it that keeps you from engaging people out in the world, wherever you are on a daily basis? That's what Jesus did. He confronted these prejudices. But here's something else about engagement. And this is something that, that really appeals to me, especially with my background. Engagement, when, when, we, when we are determined to be a people who engage our culture in conversation about the things of God, engagement exposes our humanity. Now, Jesus, Jesus was wonderfully human. That's the thing I like about the reading of the Gospels. Now, now, we in some of our traditions that have no biblical basis whatsoever, we have tried to make Jesus into something that was, that was other than human. Now, Scripture is very clear that Jesus was fully man. Also, Jesus was fully God. He was fully divine. And it's interesting when you go through and read the Gospels, the synoptic Gospels, what are called the teaching Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they tend to focus on the human side of Jesus. That was Jesus' favorite description of himself, the Son of Man. Jesus wanted to be able to connect with us. He wanted to be able to relate with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis. He didn't describe himself with these glorious adjectives. No, he referred to himself as the Son of Man. Matthew, Mark, and Luke highlight that. This human side of Jesus with occasional glimpses of his divinity. John's just the opposite. John is, is a writer that highlights the divinity of Jesus and on occasion gives us some glimpses into his humanity. And this is one of those occasions. I want you to see it. Notice in verse 6. So Jesus being wearied from his journey. So Jesus being exhausted. So Jesus being, being fully poured out. Jesus, totally exhausted, wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. He was tired. He was fatigued. But he saw this woman at the well. He saw this even though he was tired, even though he probably thought, you know what? I'll probably have another chance to talk to this woman. Even though he experienced human fatigue, weariness, he saw this as a divine appointment to engage this woman in a conversation about the things of God. I love that, that John showed this human side of Jesus. Because as you and I engage people, listen, the most effective engagement that you and I are going to have about the things of God with people who, who have no faith or people who don't go to church if you and I are going to engage this culture, and listen, folks, don't lose touch with the reality that people are dropping out of church in the West in absolute droves. Young adults are not even going to church. For the, the fastest growing religious demographic in this country is no religion at all. This is a post-church culture in which we live. And if we're going to engage this culture in conversation, they're going to have to see us as human. They're going to have to see us real. They're going to have to see us as being human beings that can relate to them, their struggles, their battles. They have to see our weariness. They have to see our brokenness. It's okay if they see us having a bad day. 
And the last thing this world needs to see and the last thing we need to do in going out and engaging this culture is to go around trying to be something we're not all pompous and pious. Oh my goodness, I, I can't smile. Look at my furrowed brow. I'm serious about my faith. See the frown on my face? You know how serious I am about Jesus. Listen, you go out and act religious like that, like some kind of religion. Listen, Jesus doesn't, Jesus doesn't need more religious nuts. He needs some fruit bearing. Because when you go out and try to play all that pomposity and pretense, religious pretense, you know what people think? People just think you're weird. Take it from a guy who didn't become a Christian until 21, a guy who didn't walk into a church until he was 21 years old. The only view I had of Christians growing up, those people are weird. You know, the ones I knew in high school, they were the ones walking around with these little pocket Bibles, you know, they wanted to beat the devil out of you. And man, they hated everything and everybody. That wasn't me. Don't go out acting like that. Be real, be transparent. Be who you are. God has given you unique gifts. He's given you a unique personality. Don't destroy what God is trying to do in your life and intersecting your life with others by trying to pretend to be something you're not or trying to act like someone you're not. Be human. Be real. Be transparent. Notice also in verse 6, engagement reaches people where they are. To engage people in conversation about things of God to, is to engage them where they are, their life circumstances. Now, I want, you, I want you to catch this. We have to do a little bit of reading between the lines on this. It says there in that last cl- clause of verse 6, Jesus arrives at the well, sitting in his weariness. And the text says it was about the sixth hour. It was about 12 o'clock noon. It was 12 o'clock high. Think of the setting of this. You're, you're talking about the Mideast. You're talking about a desert region. You're talking about high noon in the Mideast, the scorching, burning sun. And this woman comes alone. Now, you can go back in the Old Testament and do some Old Testament background work as easily as I can. But there's a text where it talks about Rachel in in Genesis 20, I think it's Genesis 26, somewhere in that area, where Rachel goes to a well and draws water at the time when women draw water in the evening. We know from archaeology as well that there were wells to draw from closer to this woman where she lived than this well of Jacob that she went to. So water is normally drawn by women in this culture, is normally drawn by, e- drawn by women late in the evening. Women going together to the well. This woman goes alone to a well that is inconveniently located in an area further from her home, and she goes alone in the burning midday sun. You know what the situation is? She's been scorned. She's ashamed. We know her circumstances as they have been described in in the verses down near the end of this narrative where, where the man she's living with isn't her husband. She's had five previous husbands. Don't you, can't you just envision this human nature being what it is? If this woman went to the well with all the other women late in the evening, don't you know the tongues are wagging about this woman? You you know what kind of woman she is. I can't be associating with her. This woman is so filled with shame, she goes in the midday sun alone to a well that is far off. Jesus met her at her point of need. When he engaged her in conversation, he didn't look at her and evaluate her and say, you know, when you clean up your act, then I can have something to do with you. You don't understand how religious I am. I can't be associated with you. 
No, Jesus knew if he was going to have any opportunity to get a foot in the door for this woman's life to be changed and transformed, he couldn't do it with pomposity and pretense and arrogance of who he was. He simply met her where she was. There's something else. Engagement, engagement is for the illiterate. I've mentioned that we're in a post-church culture. If we're going to be serious about being the presence of Christ, if we're going to be serious about engaging our culture in conversation, in this post-church culture, you have to be prepared to talk about, talk about things and talk about the things of God in a way that people can understand because if you use church language, they don't get it. They're illiterate. They're illiterate to the things of God. It's not even on their radar screen. They're, they're illiterate to the language that we use. You know, coming into the church later as a young adult gave me a unique perspective. And one of the first things I noticed was, was that, that church people had a language I didn't really know. I mean, you had your own vocabulary. It's the, the language of Zion. It, take, it takes a while to learn the language of Zion, this churchy language that everybody has that grows up in church. And I realized that, that it was a foreign language to me. Now, now, it's interesting whenever you, like if you, go to, if you go to seminary, seminary is a grad school, a, a professional school like law school or medical school. In, in your first year of, of seminary, like law school and medical schools, you learn a new vocabulary. You learn a very technical language, a very technical vocabulary. And so you, you learn this language in law school, medical school, and, and seminary, and, and you learn all this technical vocabulary, and then you learn all of these things, and you never use that technical language again. You spend the rest of your vocational career trying to put it in terms that people can understand. I mean, I don't think I've used once in a sentence the words superlapsarianism. I don't think I've used that since seminary. But I have, I have this great technical vocabulary that I had to learn, and I haven't used it once in my, in my vocational career. You're trying to put it in terms that people understand. And so when we engage the culture in conversation like Jesus did, we have to be prepared that they're illiterate. Now, notice in this passage of, of Scripture, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he, he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us this well and drank of it himself and his sons and his ca cattle? Well, the fact of the matter is, yes, he is greater than Jacob. She doesn't recognize it yet. She's spiritually illiterate. But it's not just her. It's even the religiously informed. You go back to Nicodemus that we discussed last week. You go back to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Here's a man who's well-educated. Here's a man who, who has given his life to the study of, of Scripture. What do you mean you must be born again? How can one who is, who is old go back into his, to his mother's womb to be born? He was spiritually illiterate. Neither did he, like this woman, neither of them understood who it was to whom they were talking. And Jesus is using a metaphor here and talking about, about living water. She still thinks he's talking about ordinary water. You don't have anything to draw water with. How are you going to quench my thirst? And so she didn't, she didn't understand the grammatical tool of a, of a metaphor. And so she's illiterate. And we have to be prepared to go out into the world as we, as we engage. We bring people along. We talk about, we talk about the things of God in, in, little, in little baby steps. We don't have to be the one to close the deal. We don't have to tell them everything we know about God in one conversation. There's a gradual progression that we see in the life of this woman. She goes from not understanding it all to calling Jesus a prophet to eventually recognizing the Messiah. But it's little 
baby steps, recognizing that the people we engage today, they're not familiar with the things of God. We have to avoid our church vocabulary and our church language. But people understand purpose. They understand what it means to have a purpose in life, looking for a purpose in life, a reason to live, a reason to to exist, something to do, to live for. People can relate to that. So when we engage, we have to remember that we're talking to an illiterate culture when it comes to the things of God. But I want you to notice, too, that this engagement that I'm speaking of, engagement is anticipated. It's just anticipated that you and I, as followers of Christ, we're going to recognize this calling upon our life. It's just anticipated that, that we're going to engage that we're going to, to desire to, for these living waters to come forth. Notice here in verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Don't miss the contrast between what Jesus says there in verse 14 and what he said in verse 10. In verse 10, Jesus is talking to an asker. He's he's talking to a seeker. He's talking to someone who has asked the question about this idea of living water. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? This is a woman that has asked a question. But in verse 14, he's speaking to someone who has drank of the living waters. That's that's what he means there in that last clause. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. The anticipation of Jesus is as his followers, as his people drink of this living water, it will spring forth, it will well up, it will spring forth like a fountain so that others might participate, so that others might drink of these living waters. It's just anticipated that that's what we'll do, that that's what we will be. But one final thing, and listen carefully. If you truly understand what it means to be a missional people, to be a missional church, If we truly understand that, if you embrace it, if you practice it, and only if you practice it, if you practice this engagement of your faith, this engagement with the culture, it will clarify your worship. You go out and start living the life of faith. You go out recognizing the call of God in your life to be a people who engage the culture in the conversation. You set aside your prejudices and your biases, and you just determine in your mind to be the presence of Christ at every waking moment in your life. That's what it is to be missional. You go out and set aside those prejudices, those biases, and listen, this is what will happen. It will clarify your worship. Listen closely to this passage of Scripture, verses 19 through 25. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. She started out illiterate. Are you greater than Jacob? Where you don't have anything to draw water with. But now she recognizes that, that he's a prophet. Our father is worshipped in this mountain. And you people say, she's got her own prejudice, doesn't she? But you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. And here's a Jew sharing it with her. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. That is, those who worship in spirit and truth. Those are the ones that he is seeking, not those who practice religious pomposity and pretense. 
not those who put on religious airs, not those that are consumed with being at the right place at the right time, wearing the right stuff. God is spirit, verse 24, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The day when God seeks those who worship in spirit and truth is here. The day when people will worship, true worship, he says, in spirit and truth, it is here. It has arrived. No longer will supposed worship be about bringing the right sacrifice to the right place at the right time. No longer will worship be about arriving to Jerusalem at the temple at the appointed time, at the appointed day, with the appointed sacrifice. Being dressed in the regalia of worship. Let me put it to you another way. No longer will worship be about arriving at Broadway and Avenue V at the right time, wearing the right things, and being satisfied that I've worshiped. Jesus says, I'm moving you from an institutional religion religion to a personal relationship. Somewhere along the line in our history, Jesus says, we have got away from this this personal relationship with the Father who gives life. And you have embraced with great satisfaction this kind of religious pomposity. This kind of religious pretense, this kind of, of religious pride that because you've gone to a certain place at a certain time, wearing certain clothes, that somehow you have worshiped. Now then, true worship, we're going to get back to the base. True worship is about worshiping in spirit and in truth. Now listen closely. The difference between institutional religion and a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the the difference between, between institutional religion and the Christian faith is clarified at the point of worship. Now let me give you a little test this morning. If you walk out of here this morning at what is supposed to be a worship service, a gathering of the people of God, the gathering of the saints for worship so that we might be inspired, motivated to go out and to engage this world in conversation, this cultural world that is antithetical to the life of Christ, to go out and to engage this world in conversation about the things of God. If you walk out of here this morning And all you've got in your mind is a list of mental notes. Well, I need to mention what I didn't like about that. I'm going to make a little note here. I need to call Randy this week or Bobby this week and let them know what I didn't like. And it's something based upon your personal preferences. You haven't worshipped. You have an institutional religion. Or you're going to make some little passive-aggressive comment to me about how you don't like the way somebody is, is dressed. The problem is you. Because worship is a matter of the heart. Institutional religion is preoccupied with, with the right time and the right place, wearing the right thing. But a missional faith that is engaged, a faith that is engaged with the world, if you are out there engaging your faith and you are seeing lives impacted, you are seeing lives transformed 
all the pettiness of what you like, what you don't like, what he wears, what she wears, all of that falls to the wayside because you are so filled with worship and gratitude and glorious thanksgiving because lives are being changed. Listen, we're all human. There's things I like, there's things I don't like. But you know, when we're planning a worship experience, it's never based upon my personal preferences. I've, I'll tell you the truth, I was really set back by that. You know, as a new believer, a college student going to a church, before I ever got into the ministry, I, I never once went into a service and walked out thinking about what I liked or what I didn't like. It was, it was a matter of the heart. I can worship anywhere, anytime, any setting. Doesn't have to be my, my preference. In fact, even as a pastor, I don't, I don't impose my personal preference upon you. I mean, is that not the height of arrogance? To think, oh yeah, we're going to tweak this just for you. Nothing wrong with having our own personal preferences. I have mine, but as a pastor, I don't even impose them upon the congregation. If I did, if I demanded that this worship service be designed the way, the way that would reflect my personal preferences, listen, I'd say within about, probably within about six months, it'd be me and about 25 people meeting in here. But I recognize that there are other genres. I recognize that there are other things that are capturing people's hearts today, that are capturing the hearts of the generations behind me. And as a missional church, I realize, as a missional Christian, I realize that we as the church have a mission of reaching the next generation. And so I never want to be, to be so shallow to impose my, my own personal preferences, preferences, think the church ought to, uh, I'm the pastor, they ought to cater to, to my needs. We ought to design things according to my preferences. That's the height of religious arrogance. How will you answer the question of engagement? Will you set aside your bias? Will you set aside your, your prejudices? Would you dare to be human? Would you dare to, allow, to drop the, the religious mask and to go out and engage others in conversation about the things of God? How will you answer the question of engagement this week? Our Father, the temptation is to be satisfied with coming to a certain place at a certain time and fooling ourselves into thinking that, that we have worshiped. Father, what we desire to be and what you have called us to be is a missional people who dare to go out into a world, into a culture that is hostile to the things of God, that is, that is even illiterate to the things of God, to meet them where they are, so that we might be the gracious presence of Christ in their lives with the hope and the prayer that, that in baby steps we can bring them along to recognizing who you are and the glorious and the wondrous life that you have in store for them. And Father, as we as we see you transforming human lives, as we see lives being healed out of brokenness, as we see lives and families being restored, as we have participated in that, oh Lord, it has a way of clarifying our worship and making it all about you and not about us. God, help us to have that kind of vision in that kind of understanding. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.